Inflation really is one of the most, if not the most important macro indicators that you can track on a month to month basis. And we've been seeing some mixed signals on the inflation front. CPI coming in pretty much within expectations a couple weeks ago. PPI coming in a little bit hotter than expected. More recently, PCE once again coming in line, but still inflation much elevated or above where the target is for where the Fed policymakers would want it. But why is it that inflation is so important? And we're going to talk a little bit about this. In fact, we're going to go into quite a lot of detail on exactly that. I have a lot cooked up for this video. So kind of buckle up on that front is we're going to, uh, yeah, we're going to take a deep dive into inflation. And, and, and the reason that inflation really is more important has nothing to do or is so important has nothing to do with what the vast majority of kind of macro pundits will tell you with regards to what it does to your savings or you know anything like that. What it really has to do with is inflation gives us a key signal, a key understanding, a key directional point as to where we are at in the macro cycle. And when you really get down to kind of the causal structure of the macro cycle, it matters what inflation is doing relative to how that causal structure is playing out at really the heart of the business cycle, and that is the investment function. Pretty much are companies more likely over the next few months, weeks, years to invest more, or are they going to start cutting costs and reduce investment? And that has reverberations for the entire macro cycle. So we're going to, again, take a deep dive into really the, the causal impact of inflation and why, as you can see on this chart, heading to every major recession, every endogenous end to a business cycle, you always get a big run-up of inflation. It happened before the 91 recession. It happened before the dot-com recession. It happened before the great financial crisis. It happened before the 2022 slowdown. And the chart that's on your screen right now, mind you, is inflation without energy. So we're removing the impact of oil and gas on inflation with this chart. You get it endogenously just from the very manner in which the macro cycle plays out. And you can still see the impact of inflation on the business cycle even when you remove energy. Now you add energy into it, oil shocks, that'll exacerbate the inflationary deterioration that causes the end of the business cycle. So that's what I wanna talk about in this video. If you are new here, make sure you get subscribed to that notification bell on. Got a lot more coming your way on this channel. And if you find this video particularly helpful, give it a thumbs up on the way out. All right, let's do this. We're gonna kind of take a deep dive into really kind of the causal loop, the causal cycles, and how they relate around three key important concepts. First one being just growth, right? Are we going to get growth or are we not going to get growth highlighted here in the middle? The next is inflation itself. Is inflation rising or falling? And then what does that do for the investment cycle itself? And the reason that investment cycle is important, I kind of need to qualify this idea at the outset, is this whole idea that as investment grows, or really as growth grows, investment is going to grow. One of the things that we know from kind of post-Keynesian 101 and understanding how money gets created is that when there's investment, that means a company is going to go to the financial sector to get a loan. That loan creates more money, and it also creates the offsetting liability. So you get a loan and a deposit, and that new money creation, so if a company wants to create a new widget factory, they're going to get a loan, and that loan not only gets the necessary capital to create the new output, but it also adds the additional income to then consume that output. And what you end up seeing is that as growth grows and as you push upwards on this cycle, so does investment. And that is one of the kind of key Minsky, Steve Keen insights into the business cycle is that there's this function that operates between growth and investment. And what inflation tells us, and we'll see this as we go through the causal cycle, is that it really lets us know which direction we are going on this curve. So let's just kind of start with this idea of what's causing growth in the first place. The main driver of growth is going to be higher profits. And you can see that higher profits in this little causal diagram is what's going to lead into more growth. Now let's take a step back and ask, okay, well, where do these higher profits come from? Well, they come from more demand. And we just said that one of the ways that new money gets created, that new demand gets created, is that there is an additional investment add to 
aggregate demand when those loans create the deposits that feeds back into this overall new demand and that adds to the additional profits that then feed into more growth that like i said push us up that cycle pushes up that slope to higher growth and higher investment another place where we end up seeing additional growth coming from is going to be the government sector itself when the government spends more that adds to aggregate demand that adds to profits it then adds to growth it then pushes up the investment curve adding even more aggregate demand that continues the cycle so it sounds like well why doesn't this just go on forever right well there are some leaks to this system as well or some ways in which this begins to slow down because there's also a negative feedback loop if profits start going lower so what could push profits lower well the very first thing we could take a look at is right here and that is what is generally the biggest input cost to the production process and that's going to be wages wages start to push higher as or the demand for higher wages starts to uh, push higher as the labor market starts to get tight right if you need people to create the output if you need labor to create the output and you have a booming business cycle and labor is able to look for jobs elsewhere that might pay them more and you need them to continue your output to make your profits to continue growth then you have to pay your labor more and labor is a cost and that's going to eat away at profits kind of simultaneously with that is now that you have to pay your labor more you're also going to be inclined to raise the price of your output right you need to make up for the lost labor cost and so you're going to push the markup on your product higher and if you think about it this is sustainable for a period of time because as you have to create more money to create the new growth to generate the output that new money that's getting created is going to the wage earners who now have more money who are able to pay and continue to consume the output of the macro economy at a higher price level. But this entire cycle that I'm explaining in terms of the money being generated to increase more output, to increase growth, also being the very money that is being created to consume it at a higher level, this is, well, what's caused, or what's called, what we call inflation, right? It just means that prices are going to be pushed higher. And this is now where the negative feedback loop begins. And this is where, as we said at the outset, where inflation really kind of tells us which direction those arrows are pointing because inflation begins to deteriorate the amount of profits. Eventually you reach the point where labor costs are just so high that they are going to eat into profit margins and you can no longer push markups to a point where you're just not going to get the consumption that you need to continue to generate profits. It is a classic predator prey type feedback model and that is the essence of what is causing the ebb and flow that we see in any given business cycle. And that is why when inflation really starts to accelerate and why when you get these extended periods of time of inflation that you end up seeing an end to the business cycle. It's that really inflation is kind of the symptomatic output of the business cycle that's showing, hey, we're starting to get to the end of this cycle right here where we are going to start to slow down on this slope. I guess I could show it as something like this where I'll draw in X here to designate that this is where we are at on the slope at any given time. And during the cycle, we push up, we push up, we push up into the growth, but eventually growth tapers out. And then the cycle reverses course and the negative feedback loops take take hold because all of a sudden you're no longer getting growth. So you're going to decrease investment, which is going to decrease output, which is going to decrease profits. And instead of it becoming a kind of virtuous upward cycle, it becomes a deteriorating downward spiral 
where you get collapsing growth investment in a collapsing macroeconomy. But there's one other piece to this that needs to be added, and that is this initial concept of government spending. Now, you've seen over the last, say, 15, 20 years, government spending has remained quite heightened, and this is why it's been very difficult to get a recession, even though we continue to see this business cycle play out underneath underneath this kind of broader government spending cycle, but the government spending adds into this aggregate demand. However, inflation itself has a negative feedback loop on government spending because what it ends up doing is it ends up reducing the real value of new government spending. And this is a really important concept in terms of the overall impact of of fiscal spending on the macroeconomy is you need to look at fiscal spending both in nominal and real terms, nominally, inflation is going to actually help increase the pace at which government spending happens, right? Many of the the outlays for government spending, like Social Security and whatnot, are inflation adjusted. So inflation will help on the nominal side, but there is a lag to that. It takes time for that inflation to be fully absorbed into government spending. And so what you oftentimes see is inflation just deteriorates the real additional add to aggregate demand. And we see that show up in the fact that if you just kind of think about it, if you have you know only so much money to spend every single week and you are spending the majority of that money on non-discretionary items, you know gas and uh, the sort of things you have to, 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 to use on a day-to-day basis, you know toothpaste, all that sort of stuff, and you don't have that additional income to buy new toys like a new iPad or go on a vacation or something, that you'll see that side of the macro economy, the discretionary side of the macro economy begin to slow. And at the macro level, even if you have one sector slowing while the other sector isn't, that's enough to bring the entire macro cycle to a screeching halt. And so that's why if we jump over to a chart here of the monthly treasury statement, year over year change. So essentially kind of look, trying to you know ascertain what the acceleration is of government spending. I like to, I like to do this in an inflation adjusted perspective, because it really is when we start to dip negative on an inflation adjusted basis on government spending, that that is when the market is at the most amount of risk, or really that is when the overall macro economy is solely dependent no longer on the fiscal add to add aggregate demand. It's solely dependent on this piece of it, right? And eventually, as we saw, there is a kind of predator prey ebb and flow where eventually you will get a growth cycle that is negative and kind of all consuming on itself as opposed to positive. And that happens and we are most susceptible to that growth cycle ending when fiscal spending in real terms goes negative. You know, we saw this back in the 70s, in the early 80s, the 91 recession, we got very, very, you know, very, very close to that point. Obviously, the dot-com bubble, the great financial crisis, 2022, every major bear market is preceded by government spending in real terms going negative because it is removing that additional aggregate demand that given the credit cycle ebb and flow, it's kind of natural cyclicality, given that, that it is no longer there to support the additional aggregate demand given the drag of the downswing in the cycle, and that is when recessions form. For example, if you think back to, say, 2015, 2016, we had an end to the business cycle, but we never got a major recession, and the reason for that is we just had ample fiscal at that point in time, and inflation wasn't in any way running away at that point in time. We had zero rates, low inflation, it's hard to get a recession, just simply because the fiscal support at that time is not being deteriorated by kind of the natural progression of inflation. Whereas I think this time, what we're likely heading into in a more bubble type scenario is going to be a deterioration of fiscal because of inflation. So that's why we like to pay close attention to the to the monthly treasury statement on an inflation adjusted time period. So that is uh, that is kind of what the essence is of why inflation is so important. And my final takeaway here with regards to you know what I'm seeing on inflation is, well, we are definitely above where the target inflation should be based on the Fed target. We're not late enough yet in the inflation cycle. We might be getting there. I do think inflation is likely going to start to heat up here, but we're not quite late enough in the inflation cycle for me to be, for me to be terribly concerned that kind of what I think is the credit bubble that we're in 
is anywhere near the late innings yet. I still think, at least within, now that we're in this kind of credit bubble phase, that we're likely in the early innings of that credit bubble phase. In other words, I don't expect an end to this cycle, certainly this year. Probably we're looking earliest mid-2026. And what we need to see, kind of the main takeaway from this video, is we need to see an acceleration of inflation into the end of that business cycle to say, yes, this is likely it. So that is that is kind of my, my main argument here with regards to how to understand inflation in this kind of broader cyclical terms. To finish, though, if you are an active trader, active investor, and you want data like this that you know, it's absolutely valuable now more than ever. Make sure you head on over to Applied MMT, sign up for that pro subscription. Not only do we have this data, we have fiscal spending tracked, modeled from every aspect that is important. Lots of different models that track both the credit cycle, the business cycle, and the fiscal side of things. Head on over there. Weekly updates where I explain the macro economy essentially in terms just like I did and in more depth for active traders, active investors. Head on over there, apply to MMT.com. Otherwise, that is all that I've got for today. So until next time, good trading and follow those flows. We'll talk to you next time.